our hall day workshop that's divided up into sessions. And so today we're really, it's the introduction to it. I want to talk about high performance buildings and how ventilation plays a part in that. And I am going to spend some time today talking about COVID-19 and what's happening with buildings. And ventilation is very much at the top of that conversation. So we've got some slides and some, some aspects we're gonna talk about today that really play a part in uh, what's going on in the world today. And we think a very important part. So to get started, we're just gonna, again, today is high performance buildings why we use ventilation and the importance of ventilation in that whole building concept of, of what is high performance. So when we're looking at high performance buildings and, and it, everybody, if you wanna unmute and ask a question, feel free to do that as we go through and we'll have time at the end. So when we're talking about high performance buildings, a lot of the time, a lot of people think high performance is energy efficient and doesn't use a lot of energy and that's all they really think about. But the reality is it's much more important to have the whole building, you know, the energy efficiency is at the top of that list, but durability, resilience, health and comfort are also very important aspects of that. Building a very energy efficient building and not having it meet those other criteria really you haven't created what we call or consider a high performance building. So just because it doesn't use a lot of energy, you could just uh, insulate and air seal and seal that building up tight and not have any windows and lots of insulation and air tightness. And uh, it may be a energy efficient building, but it wouldn't really be what we call high performance, especially from the perspective of the people in that building, which we're gonna talk a lot about. So when we're looking at energy efficient, obviously, again, highly insulated, air sealed, minimal thermal bridges, high performance windows, and then an efficient heating system, which generally with high performance buildings is a smaller heating and cooling system, and heat recovery ventilation is a critical aspect, and that's where ventilation component and what we're talking about comes in. Many of you may recognize this or slides, pictures a lot like this. This is a passive house retrofit of a brownstone in Brooklyn, New York. And as you can see, the retrofitted building in the middle is using significantly less energy, about 80% less energy than the brownstones on either side of it. So I was involved in that project and many others in my days with Zender and uh, these were, Really, the beginning of the whole passive house movement in New York was these retrofits of turning these conventional brownstones into high performance brownstones, high performance uh, residential buildings in New York. Durability it comes with a, a lot of those same characteristics when you air seal and insulate and do a really good job and pay attention to details, then the durability of that building is going to be enhanced. Those that know about air sealing, there's a lot of attention to detail that has to be done. And because of that attention to detail, things like moisture invasion and other issues that can cause a building to not last as long and cause rot and other problems are less likely because of, again, focus on the details. Air sealing, with a blower door test and making sure it's done well. And uh, quality control, generally when you are meeting a standard, whether it be passive house or lead or any of the other standards, there is quality control going on. And as a result of that, it tends to be a better building. Resilience is very important and high performance buildings should be looking forward to any possibilities, whether it be heat issues, extreme cold issues, drought, flooding. This was up in Calgary in Canada. They had a pretty severe flood up there a number of years ago. And so having buildings be able to uh, withstand that is an important aspect. Things like operable windows and daylighting, if you lose power, 
the ventilation system, if you don't have backup, is not going to be there. So being able to open windows in an extreme case and get some ventilation is important. Same with daylighting and having it be able to operate through challenging times. Healthy, and now we're getting into the aspects that really where ventilation plays an extremely important part. So air quality, managing pollutants, low VOC materials in the, in the building materials is an important aspect. One thing I'd like to, to really stress is no or low VOC materials. In my mind, and, and in actual application, is it almost non-existent. So just by doing using low or no VOC materials, you're not going to eliminate it in the building. There was a uh, case where uh, someone I knew who was building a brand new house. It was in California. Went to extremes like you wouldn't believe on, on the building materials. Everything that went into that was no or low VOCs. And yet, before the ventilation system was commissioned and started up, they took some levels of VOCs in that space, and it was really pretty bad, much worse than they had anticipated. So the, the whole concept of materials being the end all is really not there. You still absolutely must use ventilation. As soon as he turned the ventilation system on, the balance told house ventilation system, within 12 hours, the VOC levels went down to very, very low levels, and he had a very unhealthy environment. But that was really telling. He was a fanatic about it. He had actually lived in a house that had mold. His whole family got sick, were hospitalized, some of them. They had mold spores in their blood. I mean, it was a severe thing. So he became a fanatic, and he, he was fanatic about it, and he still didn't get no VOCs in this in the space. Humidity control, noise reduction are very important. When you start building a high performance building, you basically it's like building a sound studio. Insulation, air sealing, triple glazed windows. That was a big takeaway on those retrofits in New York that we did. Those people didn't know they lived in New York anymore. By the time you got all that insulation, air sealing, and triple glazed windows, the fire truck went by and it was background noise. It felt like somebody had it on TV and the sound turned down. And I was in many of those in my Zender days. And when I was working with Zender and we were using our HRVs, ERVs, and many of those projects, and that was one of the biggest takeaways that the homeowners would come up to me and say, you know, what's great about this is I don't know I'm in New York anymore. So sound noise reduction is a big factor on this. So that's part of the whole healthy part and uh, very, very important is controlling indoor pollutants and VOCs and so forth and providing fresh air. We're gonna talk about viruses and all a little bit more into this as we get into it. And then comfort, obviously, if you build a high performance building and it uses very little energy and does, meets a lot of these things, but it's not comfortable, then it's just not going to be something that you've achieved your goal of high performance. So exceptional air quality is huge on comfort. I can speak to this as someone who's been involved with literally hundreds of retrofits of either residential or commercial offices, other buildings. When you provide whole house or whole building ventilation, the exceptional air quality is significant. People know it the minute they walk into the space and they comment on it. And then temperature control with window surface temperatures. This is why, you know, Passive House has triple glazed windows. It's not just for energy savings. It's for the comfort side. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. If you've got a double glazed window in a building in New York, that may be, you may be able to make the numbers work on your energy use, but the comfort is lost. Because if you stand next to a double, double pane window in New York in the dead of winter, it, you can feel the cold coming off that window. It's a huge difference from a surface temperature standpoint, and you're gonna have cold spots in the room. So your comfort is not as good. You look at this picture I have on the screen here, and the people along those windows, if that's a cold climate, are gonna be at a different level than further inside, further inside the building. Absolutely, that's the, 
I've been under windows like that where it's almost like a cold shower coming down off windows. So that's part of the comfort factor that we want to keep in mind. That noise reduction, reduction is the comfort factor as well that I talked about. Daylighting, humidity control, those are all factors that play a part into a high performance building. And so mechanical noise from a noise perspective, ventilation that doesn't make noise and bother people. And usually those mechanical noises are really bothersome at the way they, those noises, the uh, range of what those noises do. So those are all important in a high performance building. And as far as high performance goes, we're at, this is New York Passive House, so this is all about Passive House, but you're probably familiar with LEED, International Well Building Institute, Living Building Challenge. They're all standards for high performance buildings. Some of them stress, you know, Passive House is very much stress, stresses the energy factor. Living Building Challenge is a little bit more holistic. LEED is uh, doing both and, and for, up until more recently uh, was criticized for its lack of the, event, the uh, efficiency on the energy efficiency side. And then the International Well Building Institute is all about health of the occupants and very much focused on that. So those are all high performance systems. And uh, now what we're starting to see is people combining these and having the, the best possible outcome for buildings. And then there's side benefits for high performance. And this is where I've, I've been up close and personal with the, in, the uh, occupants of buildings where, we, especially when you're retrofitting an existing building and turning it into, call it a high performance building, where people are happier, productivity is better. And now we're starting to see that rents and vacancies are enhanced. The value of the building is better. And if you had your energy costs by having a very high efficiency building, if the energy costs go up, that's not gonna have as much of an impact. And it can be a real big thing when you've got, if you have an office building, for example, where you've got a triple net lease with a tenant and you've got two buildings next to each other and one of them is twice as much for the energy side as, as your building, guess who is gonna have the more attractive space for renters to go to? I believe that ventilation and you know, well building standard and some of the actual testing and call it certification or labeling of these buildings for the ventilation side, the indoor air quality side is going to have a huge value based on what's happening in the world today. And so we're gonna to start to see that really bubble up and become even more important than energy efficiency, I believe. Indoor air quality and health of that building is gonna be really a factor. I just wanna show you uh, a few slides here. This is one of the things about high performance is you design and, and plan and engineer a high performance building, that isn't always what ends up in the end. And you take all the different parts and pieces that are a high performance building. This is the roof of a high performance apartment building in Maine. And when I saw this, there were some things that occurred to me that were maybe they're missing a little bit on this. So what you've got on the roof is, is, is a bunch of ERVs and you've got all those heat pumps so you got, you know, rows of heat pumps here that are used for cooling. You got ERVs, I think there are 18 ERVs on the roof. And then there are solar panels, you can't really see those. Well, I've got another picture coming to show that. And you got a black roof. So there's your solar panels that produce all sorts of heat. When these heat pumps are running, they are basically on one side putting out about 120 to 140 degrees or more on the exhaust side of that heat pump if it's in a cooling mode. 
So this roof on an 80 degree day in Maine, I imagine is probably 120 to 130 degrees potentially for all this. And here's the intake for the ERV right over there. I looked at this and I said, geez, if you'd turn these around and had the intakes facing out toward the outside of the building, that might've been a little bit better. The temperature of the air out, out over the edge of the building would probably be significantly less than what's on the top. So these are little things. The heat pumps are at high performance. The ERVs are somewhat high performance. The solar panels, that's great. You put them all together and you don't do it right and your result isn't great. So it's all how it's designed. When I went inside the building, I looked at the ventilation system and this is the exhaust in the kitchen and it's right on top of the cook stove here. And our rule generally is that you want this intake to be at least eight feet in a direct line from the cooktop here. So this is only a matter of a few feet, maybe four feet. And if this hood isn't run, you're gonna end up with grease and oil in that. And that can potentially be a problem. Small thing, but if they had located this over here or out in the ceiling, away from that, you're still exhausting out of the kitchen, getting rid of moisture and smells, but you're not picking up grease and oil. So a small thing, but again, the details matter when you're doing a ventilation system. That's the exhaust in the bathroom, which is fine. And then this is the supply in a three bedroom apartment or a two bedroom apartment, a single supply grill in the hallway. And here is the bedrooms, two or three bedrooms. So there's no, no ventilation being supplied into the bedrooms. They value engineered that out. So instead of having a, the duct come down from the roof and then go over here, a matter of a few feet, and then have a branch, two or three branches to go to th two or three grills and two or three bedrooms, they just did a single supply in the, in the hallway. And the bath and kitchen are that way. So if I'm in that bedroom, what do you think the air changes are in the bedroom with the doors open? It's not very good. And with the door closed, it's virtually zero. And I've been told that on hot summer days, there's also a single heat pump in the living room, a single indoor head in the living room for the heat pumps doing cooling. So when you go by this building on a summer day, all the windows are open and the heat pumps running at full tilt pumping cold air into the living room, but the bedrooms are uncomfortable. So they don't have any ventilation and they don't have any cooling. And as a result of that, the windows are all open. Is it a high performance building anymore? Not really. So these are the kinds of things that all the best intentions, but beware of energy uh, efficiency measures that don't get implemented quite as well. And I'm, from the ventilation standpoint, Passive house requires that ventilation be in bedrooms and exhaust out of baths and kitchen. And then the air travels from the bedrooms through that open space to its, on its way to exhaust point. And you've got air moving through all the spaces and you're getting, the bedrooms are where you spend most of your time and where you really don't wanna have high CO2 levels. This is just to really uh, accentuate that this was uh, someone, passive house guy in Boston, and he just did a little, this is a, kind of an unscientific experiment in his own house. So what you've got here on this chart is this is the CO2 level. This is where he started it. This is 11 o'clock at night. And this is the bedroom with an adjacent bathroom. This is where he turns the bath fan on on a timer. And then this is where the bath fan goes off in the morning. And you can see using a bath fan as ventilation doesn't work real well. <laughs> the CO2 levels continue to rise from 1500 all the way up to 2000 overnight. And then of course he leaves, they open the door and then it just goes back down ultimately. But from a perspective of him sleeping, he's sleeping in a room with 1500 to 2000 PPM or greater CO2 in the bedroom. 
So bath fans as ventilation are not a good solution. And if you go back to this, those bedrooms probably look a lot like this, where CO2 levels are increased and much higher than what we want for a comfortable, healthy environment for people sleeping. So that's kind of an overview of high performance and the relation of ventilation to that. So let's talk about why we ventilate in a little bit. I want to talk about some of the impacts that ventilation has. And as you might imagine, I got some uh, COVID stuff in here that's uh, been added in. So breathing is life. Why is it important? Well, people can survive 21 to 40 days without food, four to seven days without water. We don't last long without air. Now that's without any air, but with stale air, with poor air, it's gonna have an impact. And fresh air is really critical to a lot of things. So very easy to see, humidity control, CO2 concentrations, these are things everybody pretty much knows, VOCs, smells, allergens, controlling the temperature. Those are all important with ventilation. But there have been a lot of studies, I've just got a couple of them here to share, but there have been a lot of studies and you're gonna see a lot more happening with ventilation and indoor air quality. This was out in California where they studied classrooms and what they looked at is, let's take the eight CFM per student and increase it to 15 CF, CFM per student and let's, so almost doubling the ventilation rates in those classrooms in a number of controlled schools. And what they found was their absenteeism due to sickness re was reduced by almost 4%. So obviously better ventilation meant that things like colds and flu and other things were not as prevalent, didn't spread as readily. And so better ventilation translates into better health in those schools. What this meant for California schools is literally millions of dollars in state aid because they get paid by how many students show up every day. And they turn in those numbers and then the state pays you on their formula based on attendance. So if you have reduced attendance and the average school district lost over a million dollars a year in California. And obviously some of them, the LA school district is you know vast and then some of them are small, but the average school district with a almost 4% absenteeism increase would lose over a million dollars in public funding from the state. So they're starting to, in California, very much look at ventilation in classrooms and looking at ways to improve that. This was a study, Rudnick and Milton did a study very similar to that on what happens in schools, in classrooms, and the relation of, they were using carbon dioxide concentration. Really what they're talking about is air changes. How much ventilation you're doing in the spaces. Is increased ventilation have, have an impact? And they were looking specifically at, in this case, the idea of flu transmission. So what you have is a chart. This shows you your parts per million CO2, which indicates your ventilation rate. And then here is the prevalence or probability of infection spreading with one student with the flu in a class of 30 students. And then they have these different curves for one hour, four hours, and eight hours in the classroom. And so this was the probability of how many more students would get the flu in that classroom based on the ventilation rate. And so you can see if they were only in there for an hour and it's under, this is the 1,000 uh, ppm of CO2, you had a, a half a percent. So one and a half students would get the flu, basically. Whereas if it's up to 2,000, you're at uh, one and a quarter or so forth. So steady line increase in number of students that get infected based on CO2 levels, which were an indicator of ventilation rates. 
So everybody's talking about ventilation now as far in the age of COVID-19 and spreading that. This is Harvard. This, this is a specialist at Harvard talking about COVID-19 and ventilation. And there are a couple things that are really big takeaways. 100% outdoor air being brought in with no recirculated air, which is kind of the, the monkey in the room is, is what people are starting to realize. And then high level of filtration, so MERV 13 or better filtration to limit how much spread of viruses you get. So 100% outside air and highly filtered air is kind of the magic that everybody's talking about. Well, what we have on a majority of commercial buildings in North America is packaged rooftop units. And the way they work is there's a damper, most of them. And if the damper is not closed off, disabled, or outside air turned off, it has a damper that opens periodically and brings fresh air in. And the rest of the time, the air is being recirculated for heating and cooling. So it gets summertime, gets cooled here with a DX cooling system. And then that cool air is dumped into that zone and recirculated. And then there's a return air, brings it up, cools it off again, and then keeps it moving and circulates. Typically 80% or more of that is recirculated air with a damper that opens. Although I have seen in a lot of projects and we've been doing, a, I've mentioned this, we've been involved with a lot of retrofit projects that are case studies and, and pilot projects using a replacement ERV or HRV as a dedicated outdoor air system, very high efficiency and then adding heat pumps. And when we were doing that, we found a lot of these units that were on the roof were either disabled. One was shrink wrap just to make sure no outside air got in. That's, that's their maximum economizer, okay? We're not gonna let any of that cold air in the winter time. We'll make sure it doesn't get in at all. We'll shrink wrap that baby. So that was the worst case, but a lot of them were disabled or not where the damper was not working. So they weren't bringing in any outside air at all. And as a result of that, it's just recirculating. As opposed to call it passive house ventilation, which is using a dedicated outdoor air system with heat recovery or energy recovery. And so your exhaust air is picked up inside and is exhausted directly outside. It transfers energy to the incoming airstream, but these two do not mix. Passive house certified equipment, ERVs and HRVs are actually tested so that there is no cross flow contamination. It's, there's a, a tolerance, it's 3%, but it's 3% at a very high differential pressure. So it's a total on commercial units of 400 pascals. For those of you who know pressure, that's an inch and a quarter to between an inch and a quarter and an inch and a half of differential pressure between the supply side and the exhaust side. That's a lot of static. And as a result, that 3% number is very, very, basically it's no cross flow contamination. So you're taking the stale air and you're going to run it directly outside. I was, as we were uh, getting ready for this, I was talking and, and I was told that New York has told, you know, ASHRAE has told New York to shut down all their ERVs, all of them. And that's because their wheels, they're assuming wheels, which can transfer both moisture. And if you can transfer moisture between air streams, which is how wheels work, then you can transfer viruses. That shows me the typical lack of understanding that there are systems out there that are both tested and certified and designed to have no cross flow contamination. And that, that's Passive House certified for starters with plate heat exchangers. So the difference from a virus perspective, and I am convinced that this is why all these nursing homes, I've actually done some research. I went to Google Earth and looked at the roof of the worst case nursing homes. I'm in Maine. 
here in Maine and in Massachusetts, there were a couple of really bad case nursing homes that had, you know, outbreaks in them. And I went to Google Earth and looked at the roof and the roof is covered with rooftop units, recirculating the air in those buildings. And I think it's the, you know, the quiet thing that nobody wants to talk about because we've put millions of these on the roofs of commercial buildings, schools, offices, retail, you name it. Rooftop units are the predominant system that has been put on and they do recirculate. So one, one person with the virus here is gonna get picked up on the return and then distributed to wherever that zone is in the building. As opposed to, this would be picked up and exhausted directly outside and then you've got fully filtered. And again, uh, Passive House's MRF 13 filter on the intake is standard. So it's designed for that, okay? One of the things I've heard is ASHRAE came out and I've, I've been attending webinars to see what they're saying. And they're saying, okay, just put a MERV 13 filter or a MERV 15 filter on this. The only problem is it's designed for a MERV 6 or a MERV 8. If you put a MERV 13 on that, you're gonna starve the motor and probably burn it out. At the least, you're gonna use three times as much energy to pull the air through that filter is what that system's designed for. So that is a problem. It's not engineered, not designed to do what they're asking them to do. They're also saying, well, what we can do is shut off the return here and just do 100% outside air through that. Open the damper 100% and do 100% outside air. The problem is, I think it's about 90 degrees in New York right now. Well, you have to cool that and dehumidify that air before it comes in here. This system is designed for 20% here. So let's say it's designed for 300 CFM of outside air and it's running at 2000 CFM, which would be typical. So 1700 of that is recirculated air, which is going to be at room temperature. It's not gonna be 90 degree air coming in or in the winter time, 25 degree air coming in here and you have to heat it up to 90, 85 degrees to heat the space. It's not designed, it either doesn't even have the capacity or you're going to use a tremendous amount of energy to treat 100% outside air. So they're asking these systems, ASHRAE's actually come out and said, yeah, do this. They're asking these systems to do stuff they weren't designed to do. So that's a big problem. Passive house ventilation? is very simply the solution. It works, it's 100% outside air, it's brought in at close to the uh, same ambient temperature and there's no contaminant, cross flow contamination. So that's really critical. As far as performance goes, Harvard and Syracuse, it's actually the Syracuse Center of Excellence and the Harvard School of Public Health and Upstate Medical Center, Syracuse University, all combined on a study at the Center of Excellence in Syracuse. And what they did was a study where they brought in volunteers into their lab. So they, the Center of Excellence is an indoor air quality lab, basically. It was set up to test indoor air quality and to test things like VOCs, where they would paint a wall assembly, put it in their room, and they can actually with sensors, they can determine how many VOCs are being released by that paint on the wall or other material, building materials. So this lab is able to measure indoor air quality, VOC levels and so forth at a very you know, laboratory level. And it's a large space. So what they did was they set up cubicles inside their laboratory and they had volunteers from Syracuse from Tuesday through Thursday over a number of weeks came to work and worked at their desks in their lab and throughout that period, they were doing a double blind study where they were changing the CO2 levels, VOC levels, called the indoor air quality inside their lab where people were working. And then periodically throughout the day, they would do testing for cognitive function on those volunteers. And what they found was they had three different levels. They had a standard day was about 1200 parts per million CO2, which actually is not that high. 
I've seen in a lot of office spaces 2,000 on a regular basis. But they were using 12 to 1,300 as a standard day. A green day, they called it, was eight to 900 parts per million. And a green plus day, which they considered very good ventilation, was five to 600 parts per million. And what they found was on the green day, 61% better cognitive function. Pretty significant. On the green plus day, 101% better cognitive function. People didn't realize that CO2 until this was just a few years ago, until this, this study, that CO2 levels were actually affecting very, in, very impactful on our ability to think and perform functions. And one of the big things is the most affected categories were cross crisis response, information usage, and strategy. Let me ask you, when there's a crisis or you're doing strategy sessions, where does that usually take place? It's in the conference room. So everybody into the conference room, the little conference room that's got mediocre ventilation now has 10 people in there dealing with a crisis. And CO2 levels typically will spike right through the roof <laughs> and you'll have everybody in there trying to deal with a problem and their minds are not at optimum to do it. So that is very typical. So they, they discovered some really interesting things. So ventilation is really much more than just fresh air and health. It's also ability to think. Um, if you've got a, a student who's going to school, which one of those spaces would you want them in? Would you want them in a green plus day school or a regular school? And that's, an obvious situation. So we're finding that, you know, as we measure spaces, this is very, I just threw this in just to kind of show, this is a dormitory in a, a project we were involved with out in Montana. It's a um, training facility the government runs for uh, trades training basically. And so people stay in dormitories. And you can see what happens. The, the spikes are up over 2,000 every night. So this is on a daily basis. And it's on a regular basis at a very high level, over 1,500 spiking overnight. And it wasn't a real healthy environment. Also, when you put a lot of people in a dormitory like that, there's also a factor of the smells and <laughs> just the indoor air quality in general wasn't great. And so we went in and, and provided much better ventilation and all that changed dramatically and was a healthier environment. So that gives you a little bit of insight into very typical what we find in a lot of spaces where ventilation is not done all that well. As far as high performance ventilation goes, which is basically heat recovery ventilation done as dedicated outdoor air systems with a high level of energy efficiency or recovery efficiency for heat recovery or energy recovery. And these are some projects that we did that were very indicative of what the impact of high performance ventilation is on a system. Basically what we were doing with these, all these projects, and you can see there are different types of projects, some of them office buildings, a couple of restaurants, that government dormitory is shown there. And uh, there was also a terminal, airport terminal at Boeing Field in Seattle. So we're King County Airport, which is Boeing Field. And what you'll see is over here, pre-conversion, just the HVAC EUI, this one was 46 when we started. Code minimum is 44, we ended up at 12. That's replacing the rooftop unit or units. In this case, there were nine of them on this first project, nine four ton RTUs. We replaced it with one 16 ton VRF heat pump system and four HRVs. And we, and this is after a year's actual collection of data. So this is actual numbers. So we took it from 46 to 12. Restaurants typically have high UIs, but their HVAC here went from 322 to 159. 
So cut in half. The government office, this was the, the worst project we did, 33 down to 7.7. Oh, this one is the worst one here. 60 down to 37, that was only like 45%. The airport terminal building went from 117 to 13. It's about 85% reduction in energy. So what you've got there is, for the most part, those buildings were untouched as far as the envelope goes. Um, this first building put in new windows, so that contributed there. Not hugely, but it contributed. The rest of them virtually untouched on the envelope. No new windows, no air sealing, no insulation. This was just the HVAC replacement. And as a result of that, we, we achieved these very, very significant reductions. The average is about 70%. The key is we're using very high efficiency heat recovery ventilation, a dedicated outdoor air system, and again, the heat pumps. And uh, so I can't stress enough, high performance buildings, the high performance ventilation is really one of the most important pieces that you can do. Again, this is done without a single, you know, for the most part, without any envelope improvements at all. If you go in and then add insulation air sealing, you bring it down even further and have just amazing results. So a lot of people don't recognize that ventilation and that component, high performance ventilation in high performance buildings is such a big factor. So that's the basis here. And that's it for, for today. I'd like to answer questions, open it up, feel free to uh, unmute. So one thing I think which is important with, with the recirculation air and uh, pass force ventilation is uh, that the pass force ventilation office is also balanced ventilation, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's heat recovery, so your supply return on a balanced basis. We're gonna talk, I didn't get into too much of the details because that's in one of the later segments when we talk about actual design of systems and, and duct work and so forth and how you balance or slightly supply, slightly positive, slightly negative, but for plate heat exchangers, counterflow heat exchangers that we use in these very high efficiency ERVs and HRVs, balanced flows are a critical aspect of the high efficiency. So ideally you wanna have it balanced, same amount in is going out and uh, the building itself is neutral. So and you're do not you have pushing, in the winter, you're not pushing warm air out through the cracks or sucking cold air in through the cracks. You're just neutral. And do you have any numbers on rotary uh, ERVs, kind of the cross contam contamination? Really haven't done a lot of study of that. And, you know, which tells you a lot, you know, the fact that they haven't really looked at it. It's kind of the, again, sometimes there's these elephants in the room, RTUs. They haven't talked about recirculation until now. And wheels, you know, they tell you to shut them off. That started in Europe, and I think ASHRAE has adopted that here. But the idea is that, uh, again, the way a wheel works is you've got your outgoing air goes across the wheel, and the wheel has desiccant and leaves moisture on the wheel. And then the wheel turns and that moisture is picked up by dry outside air coming in in the winter time and it's reverse in the summer. But the fact that you're leaving moisture on the wheel in one direction and then picking it up and taking it back in the other direction, it reverses in the summer. When it's hot and humid, the moisture is left behind a cold, a cooler desiccant, you know, laden wheel turns and the outgoing dry cool air picks it up and takes the moisture out. Well, moisture and viruses are gonna be side by side. It's, mm -hmm. It stands to reason, and they are saying that moisture molecules in the air will pick up the virus actually and effect sticks to them. And so you have them running together. So it's just a matter of common sense until they really do test it. And so there's a question by Drake. He asks, most heat pump systems are ductless uh, recirculation types. 
one of the one of the only factor there that the question is so everybody knows that is most heat pump systems are recirculating types one factor is that most of the heat pumps um well there are there's two types there's going to be cassettes whether they are on a wall or in the root in the ceiling or a floor mounted indoor unit that does recirculate generally they're in one space so they're in one office or that in that case it's going to be you know recirculating without spreading it through the whole building there are also ducted units that would be say up in the ceiling that do a number of offices in that case you are recirculating and so potentially you could spread it yeah and, i think key and key i think always is uh, the pressure difference differential circulate inside your building or between offices right so if it's a recirculation absolutely. unit inside your office space you don't necessarily create a pressure difference and then again if it is combined with a dedicated outdoor air system as mentioned with 100 percent outside air with an hrv or an erv that good turnover of fresh filtered clean air and exhaust directly out of those spaces is going to reduce the level of virus and that's really what everybody talks about one virus molecule is not going to make you sick. It's a load that is needed is what everybody is talking about now. So by constantly turning the air over and doing air changes and providing this fresh air, you can minimize the amount of virus that's gonna be in that space and effectively remove it. This is where, where I see the problem with a recirculating system. You have one person in a nursing home that's sick in one room and is in there 24 seven. They live there and they're there 24 seven. And so that's just gonna be continually picking that up and spreading it while that person is sick. That's a theory they haven't, and, and nobody wants to look at it. I, I keep, you know, I keep asking and nobody seems to wanna to actually go out and really determine it. I'll let you in on a little secret. I bought a theatrical smoke machine and I know somebody that owns a few RTUs and I'm going to go do an experiment. We're going to put that theatrical smoke machine by the return duct, turn grill, and see if it comes back and fills the space up. So right? Drake has another question. Do you foresee more funding for ventilation system studies in the near future? Yeah, the, actually I did see, I believe it's the University of Manitoba just got a quite a significant grant to study the ventilation in their buildings on campus which include a variety of different systems so i think that you're going to start to see people doing this studying what's going on absolutely i think they're afraid of finding out what they kind of know and there's one question regarding the tuck of war between higher ventilation you know ach for health and lower ach for energy efficiency is there a sweet spot over you can over ventilate there's no question if you have good air changes continuous balance ventilation with a good air changes per hour number and passive house has a pretty good number on that then i don't think you have to worry too much about that i think you're providing optimum ventilation if it's designed and running at what the design ventilation rates are you can increase it and you know the, the key there again is passive house level of efficiency where if you're at 85 to 90 percent recovery efficiency and using very low fan power to provide that ventilation then doing more of it is going to be a minimal amount of impact on the energy side you know again going from 0.3 to 0.5 is not if you are in a very efficient system i think is a, a doable number. The other thing is, is you can always, and, and this is all in part of the controls and design, and this is part of what we recommend. We're going to get into this when we are talking about design. You want to have your ventilation unit have some capacity. You don't want to design it to be running at 100% capacity to meet 0.3 air changes if you want to be able to do 0.5. So having that capacity now, you're going to use, you know, going from 0.3 to 0.5 may use three times as much energy for your fans because you're in the higher static. There's a curve on there. And so the 
higher volume of air that you're moving has more static, which takes more power. So doubling volume can triple the energy. I'm just using that as an example. Don't, <laughs> there's a curve for all these things. So, but that's gonna be a factor. But if you design the system, and what we recommend is the HRV or ERV at its standard meeting your minimum requirement, say 0.3, is running at 60 to 70% of capacity max. Mm -hmm. That's because it's more efficient doing that, but you also want to have that boost capacity. So, and when we're talking about offices and other buildings, and again, in one of the later sessions, we'll be doing a little more detail on this, but having demand control or scheduling is really critical. So you can run it when people are in the building, if you've got an office, run it at a higher level when people are in the office and then run it at a lower level when they're not. They recommend you continue to ventilate. Don't turn ventilation off now. We've never have because again, VOCs and other things happen in buildings, whether people are there or not. So providing fresh air at a low level, you know, maybe 0.1 air changes per hour instead of 0.3 when there's nobody in the building. Mm. And right. it's also better for your ductwork to run the fresh air continuously, right? Yes. Yeah, and moisture and all the, all the things that, that you're dealing with in buildings. So it's better to just run it at a low level. But having scheduling and the ability with your systems to schedule it to run at a higher level when you're in normal, say, business hours in an office or a school and uh, having it run at a lower level when nobody's there is a really important part of the energy efficiencies. And so there's one question regarding uh, kitchen hood exhausts. Yeah, if you, the PHPP is going to give you a pretty good penalty for that. But, you know, in some places, the code just required it. And you may, you may all be aware of this, depending on where you are, what the code officers say. There's some cases where they just said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to put an exhaust hood and it's got to go directly out. That's what the code says. And that's what we're going to make you do. We don't care if you're a pass spouse. You've got to do that. And in that case, you know, we've seen it successful. It's both a penetration that's going to be leaking air and, and energy when it's not running. And when it is running, you're going to be throwing a whole lot of energy out, but you're producing heat with your stove or oven, whatever. And so on balance, I don't think it's huge. It's a really hard challenge in the passive house world. I know that there are a handful of Zenders hoods that actually are designed to go back through the HRV, a uh, compo hood. And I know a few people that uh, have those installed, but that's a challenge and they're very costly. You know, a lot of cases they've pushed people right out of the uh, viability to do that. Well, if I have a recirculating hood and, and I have exhaust with my HRV in this house that I'm in right now, and I have a charcoal filter on my recirculating hood and it works very well. I don't have any issues and I have a good, I, I can boost my exhaust. I've got four grills in the kitchen. So I've got a fairly good amount of air exhausting out of the kitchen and uh, it works very well. Yeah, and uh, my experience in single family buildings, it's really not a problem with uh, recirculation uh, hood and uh, fresh air ventilation, it, it really works have, well. It is a little challenge to get a hood that works well to do that, but I have, I've got a Mealy that's really a good, good hood. Mm. All right, so I would like to uh, conclude the session uh, and thank everyone for joining. We will have another one next week, Tuesday, same time. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Barry for the very interesting um, presentation and discussion and we will make the recording available to everyone on our website and we'll also send it to you guys uh, later on today. Thank you everybody. Have a great Tuesday.